Hello and welcome to another Cash and Sport podcast. Uh, today we've got a really interesting guest. His name is Osasu Obayuana. He is a qualified lawyer. He's a journalist and has been a journalist um, and writer and thinker and all-round sports um, person for over 20 years, 25 years, if I'm not mistaken. He's written for... More than some, that. More. More, more than, than that. that. <laughs> He's been he's been a writer and he's been an, an authority on the on sport uh for a very long time. He's written for BBC, BBC Sport, BBC Sport Interactive. He's been a consultant for Supersport, uh Transworld International. He's written for FIFA Football Mondial, The Guardian Observer um, of London, Default in Germany, uh, has written for publications in Japan, The Voice of America, and many, many others. Osasu, thank you so much for taking the time to speak to me today. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Good morning from, uh, uh, I would say, a mild Kigali at the moment. It is not sunny. Sometimes it's sunny in the morning, but just kind of mild uh, right now. Yeah, and 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 you've been in Kigali. If we if we get straight into it, uh, you've been in Kigali for just about a month now, as we were speaking prior to going on. Just under, yes. Just under, yes. Yeah, how's the how's the feeling on the ground in in Kigali in Rwanda at the moment? Well, you know, the FIFA Congress has come and gone, so life is just normal. But uh, it, it, we had an interesting couple of days in the in the lead up to the Congress and and just after. Um, FIFA were based at the Marriott Hotel. And for the time they were at the Marriott Hotel, it was like it was the Federal Republic of FIFA in Kigali. The hotel was like FIFA country. Uh, it's very interesting to see how an organization can just come into a hotel and it's like they've just taken over the entire property like they own it. Yeah. So it's an interesting experience. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's, it's it looked like it was it was quite an event. Um, and I mean, there was the the football game, there was the um, the congress itself. Um, but let's take back a little bit um, and look at you know some of the reasons why FIFA went to Rwanda. I mean, Rwanda is the fourth African country to host a, a FIFA congress. Uh, Marrakesh hosted one, Mauritius hosted one, South Africa hosted one. Um, it's it doesn't to to some people it may just seem like well they're just going to another African country but Rwanda is a small country it's got a population of about thirteen million people um, but they've been doing a lot of work with regards to their attractiveness international attractiveness and using sport uh, specifically to do that the Kigali Arena itself that that the that the Congress has hosted in um, you know has recently been being con constructed and finished um so there's a lot of work that rwanda's done to go you know to attract uh you know fifa and other organizations to come to rwanda um on the ground and and you know what you're seeing there is is all of this work being done is is that a, is that you know accumulating or amassing to towards you know attracting big organizations or is or is there something else that fifa saw uh, to be very honest with you, the, the real reason why FIFA came to Rwanda is because um, the FIFA president, Gianni Infantino, and Paul Kagame have a long-standing relationship. And that relationship dates back to when Gianni Infantino was seeking the FIFA presidency. And um, even he admitted as much during the Congress in Kigali. Um, since that Congress, I uh, know not even the Congress, let me go back a bit. Since Infantino sought the presidency in, in 2015, 2016, and he was campaigning and he, he started that relationship with Kagame, they have continued to interact and the relationship has blossomed to the point that uh, when Mosepe was elected as president of CAF in March 2021, 
I can tell you that uh, Paul Kagame played a very important role in that election. Uh, how did he do that? Um, Mosepe was contesting against Jacques Anuma of Côte d'Ivoire, who was a former president of the Ivorian Football Federation and former member of the FIFA Executive Committee and an ex-official member of the CAF Executive Committee during the time of Issa Hayatu as president, and against Augustin Senghor, the president of the Senegalese Football Federation, who was also in the EXCO as well. So, ordinarily, Senghor and Anuma have far more people who they know in African football than Mosepe. Yes, Mosepe was the owner of, well, he said was. I think he is the owner still. I don't agree that he's not the owner. He's still the real owner of Mamelo with the Sundowns, in, in truth. Um, yes, he owned the club. They had won the African Champions League. But in, in within the African football governance circles, he wasn't known at all. So he didn't have that network within the African FA presidents to be able to win an election. So, with the cooperation and involvement of President Kagame, who of course was brought into the whole picture by Gianni Infantino, Gianni, um, President Kagame made personal calls during the politicking in the lead up to that election to the president's of Côte d'Ivoire and Senegal, president of Côte d'Ivoire being Alassane Ouattara and the president of Senegal being Macky Sall. And what did he do? He convinced the presidents to tell the candidates who came from those countries to step down for Mosepe. So those candidates stepped down because their presidents told them not to contest anymore. Without that, there was no way that Mosepe was going to be coronated in March 2021 as he was in Rabat. That is the real story that many people don't know. Right. And and then obviously, because of the longstanding relationship and the, the subsequent votes that came out of CAF for, well, I mean, Infantino was... was, was was uh, elected essentially uncontested. Um, CAF was a major elected player. Elected or coronated? Sure he, he was coronated. He was coronated because <laughs> his election was confirmed by a clap of hands. There was no vote. There was no vote. Figure. Yeah, correct. Yeah. Right. So we've covered essentially two points in 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 one there. One being why the Congress was in Rwanda, which is the long-standing relationship with Infantino, and then two, the fact that. Uh, Infantino was always going to be elected. There was no, there was no one standing in his way because he paved the way essentially through 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 maneuvering and uh, uh, and and putting people in place. Maneuvering um, is actually you're being actually quite diplomatic when you use the word maneuvering. I think uh, far more stronger words can be used. To be honest, because right. let me tell you, in Africa. FA presidents were being almost um, twisted to send letters of support for Infantino to continue in office. You would think that if you are contesting for a position, you would at least show respect to those who you want to support you by personally asking for their support, not asking people to act as your surrogates and giving them the duty to get letters from other FA presidents to support you. I mean, if you need support from someone, basic courtesy should tell you that you should call them up and ask for it yourself. But was this the case leading up to what happened in Kigali? I can tell you no, because FA presidents were being if that's the word to use, by their own colleagues saying, have you sent your letter to Zurich? Please send your letter to Zurich. 
the FIFA president is expecting your letter of support. He doesn't really show a lot of respect to those who are your electorate when you seeking an office don't even have the time to call them and say, please, can I have your support? Well, what does that say about the level of respect and regard that the FIFA president has for the 53 FA presidents in Africa? You think about that and answer that question. Right. Interesting question. Um, so with that in mind, with that backdrop, backdrop in mind, what was the, you, you spent time, you went to the Congress itself. Um, what was the mood like on the ground amongst um, FA presidents, um, amongst other delegates who were there as well? Uh, well, I we sat at the back of the hall, so I didn't really have that much time. It wasn't even possible to interact with the delegate during the, the Congress session itself. So you only just notice what's going on from the, the gantry, from the galley where we were. Um, yeah, some were clapping for Infantino, some were not, you know, some were lukewarm. <laughs> you know, it's it just, you know, it was an interesting Congress to, 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 to watch. But what was actually even much more interesting was the way Gianni Infantino behaved during our post-Congress press conference. Now, I sat at the very front of the hall for the press conference. Gianni Infantino was probably like just two or three meters away from me. And he came into the press conference room and rather than just taking questions immediately, he spent about 15 or 20 minutes, you know, on a rant, complaining about how mean the media has been to him, how mean the media has been to FIFA, complaining about the kind of coverage he's getting, complaining that he's being persecuted and being treated unfairly. I mean, he basically set a very, very bad mood for the entire press conference, I have to tell you. Now, as I told you, I sat in front of him. I raised my hand six times for questions. He refused. The, the director of the communications, Brian Swanson, who was the one picking people to ask questions. Brian Swanson he, he is a former he, Sky Sports journalist, if I'm not mistaken. That's right. That's right. Um, he deliberately refused to take questions from me. It was so obvious that they had been briefed not to take questions from me. Um, it was so obvious because they refused to take questions from me. They refused to take questions from Martin Ziegler, who is the chief football, chief sports reporter of the Times of London. Um, they refused to take questions from the Nordic journalists, that's those from Norway, Sweden and Denmark, because these journalists from these particular countries have been very critical of FIFA and have been asking very serious questions of FIFA. They refused to take questions from them. Uh, and I, I'm, I don't want to disrespect my colleagues on the continent, but they deliberately handpicked journalists on the continent whom they felt would give them softball questions who wouldn't make it too difficult for the FIFA president. And I find that really, really sad. Um, for Brian Swanson, who worked for Sky Sports, you know what it is to do your job professionally. You know what you, you expect from people when he was a journalist. And now you become a director of communications of FIFA. And it's like you're you're being a, a special assistant to the dear leader. I mean, it, it reminds me of a North Korea-like atmosphere. And I find that really, really wow. sad. This is where football is going. Wow, that's quite an indictment. Um, it is, if, yes. Yeah, moving on to, 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 to the substance of the actual Congress. Um, there were some major announcements made. Uh, first, with regards to um, the World Cup format, which we've known um, that it was going to increase. Um, mm -hmm. FIFA's um, allocation towards CAF is now going to go from five 
slots allocated to nine with the possibility of nine point yeah, five. five with the possibility of another through a playoff. Um the Club World Cup uh format is also going to change uh from 2025. Mm-hmm. Um, there's other, you know, considerations as well. One of the considerations was one of the announcements was with regards to FIFA funding, um, mm. and and allocations to towards member states increasing as well. Um, mm-hmm. Can you talk me through that and and how that affects Africa? Obviously, the the increased slots at the World Cup are great for Africa because we'll have four more teams there um, at least. Um, but the the funding one is 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 a particularly important one because it means that federations can do more. With regards to the money FIFA is giving, listen, yes, it's good that FIFA is going to give more money to the FAs, but the question is, are you really going to develop a football industry in any African country? based on what FIFA gives you? The answer to that is no. So for me, yes. I mean, the grants that Nigeria would get from FIFA are the very same that the UK would get, that the US would get, that France would get. Everyone gets the same amount of money. But for the UK, this money doesn't really matter to them, okay? doesn't matter to France, doesn't matter to the US, doesn't matter to Germany, doesn't matter to Japan. Why? Because they actually have a football industry that is generating money, that they have an ecosystem that has economic value, that employs people in football, that enables ancillary industries to work in football. You know, it's it's a whole ecosystem that is self-perpetuating. That is what we need to develop in Africa. We are not supposed to be saying, yay, FIFA is going to give us an, an extra million or two million or three million. What is that going to do for Nigeria or Egypt? or Morocco. I mean, Morocco, they are not thinking of how much FIFA is going to pay them. They are going about developing their football, building an ecosystem for their country. Those are the issues really that concern me. Whatever FIFA is giving to African federations, it should be a bonus. It shouldn't be what federations are depending for, I beg your pardon, depending on to run football. If that's what they're depending on, then, you know, we really have a lot to worry about because it means that they are not developing a local ecosystem that will ensure that football in their countries is self-perpetuating. I don't know why people don't get that. Right. No, absolutely. The being being able to be self sustainable outside of of FIFA, uh, because I mean a grant is a grant, but beyond the grant, um, you know the grant doesn't cover all of your bases. Um, you know what other sorts of resources internally are you are you able to muster up towards the the development of football and and being able to be competitive, um, because let's let's be honest, apart from Morocco now. Um, who had a really good showing at the last World Cup? Um, Africa's not really done that well at you know um, at international tournaments at World Cups. Yeah, but, uh, but how, how are you going to do well when your domestic football is not healthy? I was in South Africa before the 2010 World Cup. I went to each and every venue. We had we were invited by the LOC. We went on a whistle stop tour. They hired a, a chartered plane. They took us around every venue in South Africa before the World Cup. So I saw everything that was being done before that World Cup. If they had the right quality of governance, South Africa in the decade following that World Cup should have a league in terms of the technical quality in terms of the players it produces, 
should have been among the best in the world because they had the money to now deal with the issue of training and producing a critical mass of talented footballers. South Africa is a big country. It's a country of 50 million plus people. Right. If you can imagine that Croatia with a population of 4 million, 4 million is not up to the population of Johannesburg. They have reached the World Cup semi-final and final. They, Croatia has a better World Cup performance than the entire African continent. And they only have a population of 4 million. So, and Croatia is not as rich as South Africa. That is very known in terms of GDP, in terms of everything. It's a richer South Africa is a richer country. So they had a surplus of about $85 million after the World Cup in 2010. We're talking of 2023, and Safa are in debt. Right. How the hell did they get there? What did they do with all the benefits of the World Cup? I feel really, really sad. I mean, I don't, I'm Nigerian, and of course, I want Nigeria to always have the better of South Africa when it comes to football. But I am concerned that 13 years after a World Cup, that we don't see the type of progress in the PSL, in South African football, that we should be seeing. And how are you going to have it when Safa, on the one side, sees the PSL as an enemy, just because the president of Safa, Danny Jordan, and uh, the big cheese of the PSL, Ivan Koza, have never seen eye to eye. Never. And because of their personal issues, South African football is suffering because you can't have proper development of the league if the National Association is not cooperating with the league. And the, the national teams cannot develop players the way they want to if they don't have cooperation from the professional game because the professional game is the everyday window right. for the players. So when you have this type of conflict that has gone on for more than a decade. Yeah, it's more than a decade. I, I can't remember the last time Jordan and Koza saw eye to eye on anything. How do you develop a league or a whole ecosystem for South African football in this type of environment? If if we were to assess um, Osasu, um, the the state of of African football as as it were. Um, you you mentioned Morocco just before this example, um, and and how they've developed their football and concentrated on 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 their football. Uh, how do we, as as Africa, what what are they doing right that we can emulate in in other African countries to get us there? Okay, one they are putting in the money. Two they are not embezzling the money. They actually spend the money properly. So when you see what they construct in Morocco for a million and a half or two million dollars, in many other African countries to do the same kind of work, they're probably spending two or three times that amount, four times. And 80% of that money is going into kickbacks and people's pockets. Right. In Morocco, that's not the case. When the money comes, they spend the money how it's meant to be spent. So they build the infrastructure, then they know that it's not enough to build infrastructure. You have to maintain the infrastructure. And then when you have built and you're, you are maintaining the infrastructure, you need to bring the right technicians in to actually develop players. But at least those players know, or those uh, technicians know that they have the right environment within which to do their jobs. And so, I mean, a Moroccan player who plays for Widad or Raja, when he moves to Europe, it's not going to be that much different for him. The, the, the training camps are top class. The pitches are top class. 
the professional environment is taught to them in Morocco. Yes, they may not earn. The only difference between playing in Morocco and playing in Europe is that they don't earn as much money, of course. But in terms of the structure, in terms of how they train, in terms of how they approach the game, the players get such a good education at home that when they move to Europe, the transition is not that huge. But you compare that to somebody who is playing, I don't know, for gold. Okay, I mean, in South Africa, if you're playing for an Orlando Pirates or Kaiser Chiefs or Sundowns, I mean, the facilities are quite good. The, the only question is how good are, is the coaching? Right. How good is the teaching of football to the players? Do the players have a real professional attitude in South Africa to the level that when they go to Europe, they are able to adjust fast? That's well, the, well the stats the stats don't back that as well. The, the stats basically say no, because South Africa, according to FIFA reporters and FIFA stats, has become a net importer of players and not an exporter of players. We import more players from from countries around us. Uh, from you know, Zambia, Zambia, from Malawi, Malawi from Malawi, Zimbabwe, from Angola. Recently. Been, you know, which, yeah, in, which in itself, minimal. which in itself is not a bad thing, because if you want to have a, a league that is of international standard, you do need to bring in players from all parts of, of Africa and the world. Even the problem is that the clubs are not building the right football development structures to bl- to bring the players in themselves. They are so focused on winning the PSL or not being relegated, that they just want to have players who can do the job for the moment. But what about thinking of what is the club going to be like in five years, in 10 years, in 15 years? You have to think about it. You have to plan it. And, you know, things are not just about winning a league every year. I mean, in South Africa now, the dominance of Sundowns is just... In some ways, it's actually killing the league now because people don't even know what to do. In the days that you used to have a real rivalry between Kaiser Chiefs, Orlando Pirates, you could then say, okay, no one knows who's going to win the league. There was a time in South Africa we had a league being won by a Manning Rangers. It's when you don't have competitive equality in a league, then there is no competition. And then it even affects the marketability of the league because people say, oh, Sundowns are going to win again. What's the point? A league has to have some unpredictability. It has to have some excitement. For people to say, oh, we're going to, we're really looking forward to watching a league. And South Africa, in terms of the rest of sub-Saharan Africa, is probably so much farther than the other ones. So if we, are, if we are talking about the situation in South Africa, what are we going to talk about when it comes to Nigeria, Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire, uh, DR Congo, Angola? <laughs> you know, that is, uh, you know, we, we can talk about that for days. I mean, I don't even want to talk about the state of the Nigerian Football League right now. It's, I am so disgusted and disillusioned by it that I don't even talk about it anymore. It's been fraught with with match fixing and match buying and corruption for so many years that I can't even take it seriously. And unfortunately, that's the case. Um, even if you look next door in Ghana, where they've where where there's been corruption and match fixing allegations consistently for for the last few years. Um, and uh, it's it's the state of African football is is quite perilous at the moment. Um, but there there are some guiding some shining lights, as you say, in in, in the likes of Morocco. Uh, but Osasio Bayuana, I think we we've, we we can wrap it up there because we can go on and on and on and on and speak about this for for the next ten days if we wanted to. But as as a final parting shot and as as a final assessment. Um, as a final question, actually, there's rumors that um, the CAF president, Patrice Mutsepe, would not be contesting another election. Um, what is your take on that? Well, I think it really depends on what he wants for himself. I mean, for Mutsepe, I think he, he, he wanted the position on a personal level for visibility, for access and 
I mean, for him, football is like a playground. And having being a vice president of FIFA and being a president of CAF, I mean, there is no playground that is bigger than that. But I have to say to him, I haven't been able to say to him directly because CAF officials have refused to allow me interview him since he took over in March 21, that the leadership of African football is not a part-time job. Being a president of CAF is not a part-time job. He has been president for over two years now. I mean, he, he took over in March 21. Uh, we are now in, okay, two, is it March 21? Yes, March 21. So it's just about two years now, just over two years, actually, because we're getting to the end of March 23, right? right. So he has not spent one whole week in Cairo since he became president. This is not something that is acceptable under any guys. If you're a president, then you lead, and you don't lead by being on Zoom in Johannesburg. You don't lead by just popping into the office one day in a week and not showing up for another month. If you're a leader of African football, you have to take it as your full-time job. Nobody begged him to take on, well, some people begged him to take on this job, but he didn't have to do it if he's not prepared to give it all his time. He is so busy with all his other business interests, like CAF is like another thing on his, on his schedule. And that was not the case with all the other presidents that we have had. Issa Hayatu was there for 29 years. Yes, that was too long. But he didn't have any other thing than that to do. It was his full-time occupation. When Nyakachu Tesema, his predecessor, was CAF president, it was the same. African football is not a spaza shop. It's not a, a, a corner shop where you just cast an eye on it occasionally to see how things are going. No, you've got to give it your full attention. And if you're not ready to do that, then by all means, please give way to a president who is prepared to give it his all when he is in office. Sasu Bayoana. <laughs> that was quite a parting shot. <laughs> that was quite a parting shot. Um, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for being with us today and continue to do the work that you do. Uh, continue to being, continue being a trailblazer. And we look forward to that big expose, um, uh, that big article that you've got, that you've been working on. I've done it. It's in the blizzard. Go to the blizzard.co.uk and you can buy a copy online and you, it, it's there it's been there for like a, a week now so you can go there his name is osasu obayawana he's been my guest today thank you so much for your time you're welcome